multi-service CENTCOM and SOCOM. He presented in the outpatient setting February 2015. No complaints. He was sent here because of EKG. We see a lot of patients who are sent here because of what's called abnormal EKG as a diagnosis. Since 1992, he's uh, every time he shows up somewhere, his EKG is performed, and somebody says, "Hey, you got a weird-looking EKG." And so he had an EKG that was repeated at McDill Air Force Base that showed new T-wave changes, and he was referred to us. He has no symptoms at all whatsoever. And so Malika, here's uh, one EKG that we have on him. That's his oldest EKG that we could find. Would you like to take a stab at this, Malika? Sure. Uh, so the rate is, I'm sorry, I can't read those lines really well. Um, it's probably about uh, 65 or so, or 60. Um, and for the rhythm, there is a P wave in front of every QRS complex. Um, and it looks like it's a normal axis deviation. Um, and I don't see any um, ST or depression. Um, I do see um, elevation in in T waves in V2, V3, uh, V5, V6. What would you call the T wave? Um, um, the ST segment elevation, what would you call that in terms of terms? ST segment elevation? Yeah, what would you call it? Uh, is that early repolarization? Is it acute injury? Is it uh, um, Brigada syndrome? Is it something weird? I would probably call it early repolarization. That's good. And then there are two kinds of early repolarization. One type uh, actually is associated with sudden death, and the other type is uh, normal, seen in a lot of uh, athletes and seen in normal people. Uh, any characteristics of this type? Is this a bad one or a good one? Um, I think this is a good one. Yeah, you're right. It's a, you had a 50-50 chance on that one. It is a good one. <laughs> And the bad one has uh, SD segment depression or horizontality that uh, that is somewhere begins or is involved in the uh, SD segment elevation early repo type pattern. And so this is different from that pattern. You can look it up online and see there are two patterns, and uh, this is this is the common pattern. So this is the good one. So uh, basically, uh, the guys had some exercise tolerance testing that was normal. Uh, he had a trans, uh, trans thoracic echo, 1992, and uh, there were no abnormalities. And there was some question about something there, pulmonary flow, left to right flow. That's probably artifact. And uh, it was repeated, and it was indeed artifact. It's probably a coronary sinus return, looking like an atrial septal defect or PFO, which it wasn't. We have another EKG, which is the most recent, which resulted in his referral to our office. And so, who would you like to take a stab at this one? Sure. Uh, it's sinus, um, rates with the normal limits, axis is okay. Obviously, the thing that's jumping out are the T wave inversions, which are pretty deep, uh, more than 10 millimeter T wave inversions. So, uh, that we go in favor of um, gamma apical hypertrophy kind of pattern. At least that's a consideration. Um, ischemia, sure, can mimic it, so you can't rule it out 100%. But there's no really Q waves, although the picture is not very clear, but I don't see Q waves or anything to go along with it. At least from my screen, we too looks a little bit elevated, but I'm not sure it's my screen or if it's really there. Um, yes, the segment. Um, other than that, yeah, the T-wave inversions are what are really jumping out. Okay, definitely this is a strange looking EKG that knocks your socks off. And so 
no question, there's still SD segment elevation somewhat. And, uh, and then there's these deep T wave inversions kind of everywhere. So uh, let's see what we found out uh, on this patient next. He shows up in the clinic, and this is what he brings with him. And uh, his history, father had coronary disease, had bypass grafting twice, grandfather passed away in his 50s from MI. Family history is very important, especially in coronary artery disease or sudden cardiac death or weird EKGs. And so there's the family history. Social, doesn't uh, smoke, and he's on a statin drug for elevated cholesterol. So is everybody else. He's on fish oil too, like everybody else. And so physical examination, nothing. And what to do next? He's in our clinic for the first time. Uh, let's see. Malika, what do you think we should do in this guy in our clinic? Uh, so I would go ahead and get um, an EKG first. That's a good one. I like that. Here we go. What do you think about this EKG? It's prettier than the other one. I see T wave inversions. One, two, three, almost everywhere. Um, and I see uh, ST segment elevation in V1, V2, um, V4, V5. So this. This is an anterior and septal MI. So, uh, and we don't have any Q waves. So this guy has no chest pain. So would you still support that diagnosis? Um, no, but just by looking at the EKG, he has um, SD segment elevation in, in leads V1, um, V2, and then V4 and V5. So you think this could be like a STEMI? Going by just the EKG, it could be, but the patient is asymptomatic. Of course, we presented an asymptomatic patient like this uh, the other day, and uh, turned out to be a Takatsubo without symptoms, an asymptomatic Takatsubo with lots of EKG changes just like this, ST signal elevation, T wave inversion, all this stuff. And the, the lady was at Takatasubo and took her to the cath lab and he had normal coronaries. So that was our last presentation, I think. Yeah, so what do we do now, uh, Malika? Well, <clears throat> we don't know if that's what this patient has. So I would probably take the patient to a cath lab <clears throat> and see what's going on. Okay, the Takatasubos that we see are basically um, usually female. I don't remember a single male Takatasubo in our practice. I've never seen a guy with that. So okay. that sort of excludes that quickly for me. Never seeing, never having seen that doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but I've never seen it. Okay. So we did an echo and uh, there's a little thickening. Could be an athletic heart. The guy works out. And so like mild concentric LVH would get you thickness of maybe 12 and a half, 13, and then everybody's got a little non-obstructive left common carotid plaque. We look all the time, and there's a little bit there, and this is non-calcified, so we saw that. And so what are we going to do next, Malika? Okay, concentric LVH. Yeah, it could be an athletic heart. It's a guy who works out quite a bit. Most of our guys from the base uh, have a little thickness because of working out. And here we go. What to do next? We're going to do a stress test, CCTA, cardiac MRI, Holter monitoring, lipid profile, CRP, medical therapy, yeah. reassurance. You know, people from, uh, people from uh, McGill require um, a lot of them are pilots, and you got to have a high. Uh, a high uh, index of suspicion and make sure everything's okay for sure because they're flying, you know, fifteen million dollar planes around over your house maybe. So Pooh, what do you want to do next? Uh, CCTA. That will give us answers whether it's the coronary like it's a good um it's a good sensitivity. So if we see C A D we know if it's C A D. If we see something else that's abnormal. Um, so back to the, this is a song that I will keep singing, 
and so you're going to hear about this quite a bit because we're trying to introduce CT and MRI to HCA West Florida. So as you know, non-invasive cardiologists have been going around riding these little two-wheeled two two vehicles for a while and uh, they look pretty unstable to me. I don't know how that thing's standing up, but they got Echo and Nuke and uh, we're supporting that you should be driving this little red Ferrari with Echo, Nuke, CT, and MRI. And so, as you know, uh, Echo slowly evolved uh, since 1972 or so into a very, very good technology. I dragged an Echo machine from Indianapolis from Dr. Feigenbaum's place down to Tampa in 1972 and uh, the people at Tampa General said, put it in the basement. We'll give you a room in the basement. This is not going to catch on. And uh, Bill Strauss helped me start nuclear cardiology at Tampa General and uh, with a planar image that's very similar to that planar scanner up there. And that's evolved, uh, I feel, into spec scanning, which is a fail, and then PET scanning, which is outstanding but very expensive. And then all during this time, CT and CMR has been gradually reaching maturity but virtually ignored by cardiology except university hospitals and publications. And so all of a sudden now we've got two mature uh, imaging techniques that really aren't being used in any of our hospitals. And so the question is, how do we bring this to full performance in a short period of time as mandated by the COCATS-4 or Committee for Cardiovascular Training for Cardiac Fellows. And so that takes us to the traditional cardiology algorithm, <laughs> which I maintain is a false start because we sell the six pack, which is history, physical, EKG, echo, spec, and cath. And the gatekeeper is the spec scanner, which we can change those numbers now. It was 1367. Each year it gets lower. Now it's like five or six hundred dollars. And uh, Blue, Cross Blue, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan had a 40% false positive in the state of Michigan. That's like 47 hospitals. And uh, someplace else in Ottawa, Canada, is an 88% false positive. And Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan was a 65% false negative. That's really pretty close to a coin toss. And so those patients go on to have cardiac cath. That's why they have 60% negative cardiac cast and so the new model that we're proposing which nobody can get to because they don't do CT and MRI is a low cost, low cost CT less than $300 at Memorial Hospital. MRI about $500 and uh, MRI is no radiation, CT is low radiation and spec scan is high radiation so uh, and of course the sensitivity and specificity is much higher on CT as well as MRI than the current stuff that we're using and these are numbers from university hospitals which uh, where, where they haven't dumbed down the technology and so let's look at the CCTA which you ordered Pooh, because you finally got on the program here and you see that's our drift so we'll mm -hmm. take a look at that hang on uh, unfortunately uh, there is a name on here uh, certainly uh, everyone here has signed uh, HIPAA agreements and we're uh, HCA Florida West Florida so we're all HIPAA compliance, so please ignore uh, if we did not delete names. And so we're looking through uh, this is our uh, anterior and uh, the sternum, and then we have posterior. And uh, we're looking through this image at the uh, pulmonary artery, which is in the center on the right, our right, not the anatomical right. And you can see uh, the aorta on your left, and then towards the bottom is the descending aorta. And uh, we're seeing some pulmonary veins come in. We should be seeing left atrium coming in soon. There's the origin of the left coronary. It's a normal anatomical origin. There's the origin of the right coronary. It's a little more superior than it usually is. It's at 12 o'clock. Uh, on this image, where usually it's at about 11 o'clock. This one's usually about 5 o'clock, the left. Let's see if it's 5. Yeah, it looks like about 5 o'clock, 4.30, 5 o'clock. And so we come back through here, and we're looking at the coronaries, and they're looking pretty good. We did inspect the coronaries thoroughly and they were entirely normal. And the only thing we have here of any interest, which is our topic of conversation today, is the displaced papillary muscle that is oriented towards the apex. 
And so this is an apical instead of a mid left ventricle papillary muscle. Very unusual presentation. Usually a papillary muscle is where my little arrow is. It comes up here. And this is an apically displaced papillary muscle base that's very broad. We can also measure uh, the septum, posterior wall. And of course, you saw that uh, that was sort of borderline LVH or mild LVH. Everything else is looking fine here. Looking at the left ventricle cavity, we're looking at the right ventricular cavity, looking at the right atrium, left atrium's coming in view, mitral valve, and everything else looks pretty good. So we've got an apically displaced papillary muscle. Who have you ever heard anything like that, an apically displaced papillary muscle? Yeah, I mean it's in the lower third of the insertions down, so sometimes it can like mimic uh, hokum kind of physiology, especially the apical variant, with same clinical features too. Okay, and then we usually have a uh, radiology overread, uh, which basically was unremarkable. So uh, what do we do next? And we gave you a whole bunch, whole raft of things to choose from here. We have normal coronaries, by the way, so going to the cath lab would have made the diagnosis of normal coronaries, but we wouldn't have gotten any further in terms of getting a diagnostic workup in terms of understanding what was wrong with this patient. So we went directly to a less than $300 test, got the information, saved a lot of money, and uh, some of our fellows were quick to jump on this and recognize, hey, look at that papillary muscle. It's at the apex. This is one of those things that if you don't know it, you don't recognize it. So you only diagnose what you know. And so we have presented a case recently of non-compactional left ventricle, the so-called molo-molo syndrome of these two isolated non-compactions that we saw in someone. And uh, nobody knew what it was because nobody knew about non-compaction. So you got to read and understand the greater repertoire of pattern recognition you have the closer you are to not being replaced by a computer. So any comments uh, on anything else you want to do, Pooh? Uh, MR is an option to see if there's any obstruction caused by the papillary muscle or where exactly that's inserting more spatial resolution. Uh, there's a lot if he's asymptomatic. Um, it exhibits tolerance is good. I don't think we need to do it. It's just MR. Okay, uh, CJ, welcome to the conference. We're glad to have you here. CJ has been at point. CJ and I used to work together. She's in the cath lab there. Of course, we did some CMR. So let's look at our CMR. Hang on as we transition there. So here's a CMR that you can recognize that is not a CT scan. It's a black blood scan. CT scan, you'll have a bright spine. There's no bright spine there. There's no bright sternum. Actually, it looks like uh, the brightest thing is some muscle and fat and stuff. And so fat, actually fat's the brightest. And so we're looking here at the origin of the right coronary. We're over here looking at the origin of the left coronary. We're looking at the myocardium. Here's this papillary muscle angled towards the apex. It depends on how you cut this slice but it's uh, displaced to the distal one-third, we call the apical segment. Black blood images are very helpful in understanding anatomy. And so this is actually, a, there's no contrast, it's just black blood uh, sequencing and uh, very useful for telling us more about the heart. And so we just confirmed what we saw before is uh, this papillary muscle sort of blending in. Look how thick the left ventricle becomes as this papillary muscle blends into the inferior apical portion. And actually, the half of the ventricle is encompassed by this papillary muscle structure. I can see how this would give you abnormal EKG, abnormal repolarization. Uh, I don't know why it changes since 1992 to now, why, why there's a gradual change, but uh, there is in the, in the EKG. And so we've got that markedly ischemic look and pattern, ST segment elevation. We've got the, the uh, T wave inversion. And all of that is because of this big hunk of muscle here that's this papillary muscle. 
The other papillary muscle is not well visualized in this particular view. And I don't think we have, uh, we may have another view to show you that. Let's go over here. Can I bring that over? Oh, okay. Oh, there we go. Yeah, here we go. We can see the ventricle. And you can see it squeeze. That's pretty good. So you see it squeezes normal. You can see that there's really uh, no significant mitral regurge. I'm running it back and forth by hand. Um, so that looks pretty good. And uh, we'll come through here. And we'll show you what we can. Oh, there's the apex. And we're working our way up. Uh, through the left ventricle, through the chamber, getting a couple papillary muscles there. There's one anyway. Looks like that's really the big one. There's the other one opposite it. And so, and then we're coming up above that. So MRI is great. I love these pictures. I don't know if you're used to seeing pictures like this. Oh, there's the LV. Oh, there we go. Papillary muscles. Here we go. We've got the insertion. We've got two heads on this papillary muscle and it's squeezing and the whole thing just gets really thick during systole and look it's almost obliterating the apex isn't that amazing it doesn't look like the thing we see where you see the spade abnormality during systole and apical hypertrophy but you can see this is an apical hypertrophy but it's not the hypertrophic myopathy of Asians involving mostly the apex it's these papillary muscles that are inserting and so that's really, really very, very interesting. Doesn't it? Here's a papillary muscle over on the other side. You know, I can't tell much about its insertion. We never look over here at right ventricular papillary muscles. And so there's some more systole. And these images are just beautiful. You can see why I would be involved in doing this technology. This is the right ventricular outflow tract. There's the uh, aorta. Some left atrium over there. Here's pulmonary pulmonary valve. You can see why this would be so much fun to get these images that look so nice. Here's a papillary muscle. Here's a papillary muscle. You can't tell much about where they are. And then we're back to a black blood study, which is what we started with. We've got all kinds of stuff. I mean, look at this. This is really neat. Uh, this is a, a way of putting a, a grid on the left ventricle, and it can tell you all about these grid components moving back and forth, and you can measure strain with this grid. It's a very sensitive measurement of strain. Uh, the grid was first uh, developed at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore by Dr. Zahudi. I went to visit him to see his grid. It was pretty cool. It still looks pretty cool. And so uh, we've got another grid here. Here's the other grid. And so uh, we can actually put this into a computer program, which we're going to be doing uh, from Myocardial Solutions. And it's called HARP. And we'll be able to show you the strain measurements from this grid. And there's another one called SYNC that will give you the strain measurements of one heartbeat which is pretty cool. Here's these papillary muscles coming from the apex. There's some artifact on that particular picture. This picture is probably a contrast study, and we probably got contrast moving through here, which can't uh, make it go fast enough to see it. And here goes contrast. Here we go. We've now taken the myocardium, and we've actually filled the myocardial arterioles and arterioles have been filled with contrast. So we inject the contrast was injected peripherally, it was gadolinium, and the gadolinium came into the right ventricle, there it is, comes into the left ventricle, comes in the coronary arteries, and then fills the myocardium equally all the way around. A few little gray artifacts, subendocardially, this and that, but uh, essentially normal. And so that's beautiful really pretty. So this is the imaging study we do with LexaScan and with REST and then compare them. And so I don't know if you've ever seen that before. Anybody seen one of these before other than my presentations? And so this is the easiest way. You can make every MRI test, every MRI scanner can be a stress test machine using a chemical stress and uh, you can actually do this in 10 or 15 minutes if you want to. 
which is pretty cool. And then we're probably trying to null the left ventricle so that we can look for scar. And we'll be looking for that in just a minute. But I want to show you this part where we're actually doing all this stuff is called phase. And this is actually the same principles, uh, for example, as Doppler, where we can actually measure blood flow in the aorta and pulmonary artery. We can measure the blood flow, which is just amazing. And we can tell you what the aortic valve area is. We can tell you anything you want to know about shunt flow. And uh, This is probably the first presentation you've ever seen of phase, which is very similar to Doppler and gives us extreme capability of telling you anything you want to know about a valve or a shunt or a cardiac output for that matter. So uh, very versatile technology. And now we've taken the heart and we've nulled it, which means everything is going to be black except gadolinium. And if gadolinium got caught in the interstitium because there was edema or scar tissue or something, we should see a bright white spot in the heart muscle itself. And we're not seeing anything that's a bright white spot. There would be just a big bright spot in there somewhere, depending upon what we're looking for. If you're looking for amyloid, sarcoid, uh, if you're looking for myocardial infarction, that's what everybody talks about. And that's the gold standard for myocardial infarction. So despite all the stuff you saw on that EKG, there is no ischemia and no myocardial infarction demonstrated by any of these very sophisticated tools. Here's this papillary muscle insertion. There's the one we've been looking at. Here's the other one we haven't been looking at. And uh, it also is apically driven. Doesn't seem like the alignment has done anything in terms of disrupting mitral valve apparatus, which is very sensitive. And there's no white spots, bright white spots in here of gadolinium enhancement. So we're happy about that. No scar tissue, no infarct, no ischemia. T2W tells us about edema, no edema. And so we have gone through this looking for all the pathology. And this is like a one test tells all. And basically, we haven't stumbled upon anything that we hadn't recognized previously. But we've ruled out a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, including microvascular obstruction with microvascular disease that gives you funny looking EKGs but n normal coronaries. And so we've done everything non invasively. This is our, what we feel the four wheel Ferrari can do for us give us all the information non invasively. So let's go back to our slides again. Is there anything else you want to do on this patient, uh, Malika? How about you, Pooh? Anything you want to do? Not really, just reassure him. At this point, it's not gotten to the point where it's causing obstruction or anything to do beta blockers or something. Yeah, so I actually, uh, we don't see a lot of cases of the apical displacement of the papillary muscle. I worry about everything. That's my job. I especially worry about young people who are in the service. And so basically, I was concerned that you know, maybe there's a channelopathy, maybe there's something else. You've all heard of Brugada syndrome with SD segment elevation, right bundle. Maybe there's something else going on here that I'm missing. And so basically, I did a whole monitor. There's some PACs and PVCs. I'm always worried about funny looking EKGs leading to sudden cardiac death. And so, by a spontaneous mutation rather than a familial uh, genetic uh, acquisition from birth. And so, I'm, I've become very sensitive to that, so I send him to a cardiac electrophysiologist because of channelopathies. They, uh, I think there are guidelines for channelopathy uh, genetic workup by uh, Canada. I know I saw those a couple of years ago. There may be some U.S. guidelines by uh, the Rhythm Society, and so basically I worry about that. I had him see an EP doctor. They performed uh, genetic uh, testing. And it was negative. So you don't hear a lot about genetic testing. We're going to tell you more about genetic testing. As a matter of fact, the patient we presented the other day with uh, the non-compaction is going to get genetic testing. We're also going to test the family. And so we're not talking about DNA much, but we should be talking about DNA a lot more. And so hopefully every conference will say something about DNA, 
RNA or protein. We have talked about protein markers and we've talked about protein expressions and one of the tests which uh, was the pulse test. There's another test called the Chorus CAD for coronary artery disease. That's 23 messenger RNAs. And so we're very involved in DNA RNA testing as well as protein testing. And so we want to tell you more. So the differential diagnosis of this is apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So we need to know that he doesn't have that. So that means we need, need to know about another disease called apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So let's take a look at one of our patients who had that. Okay. So it's more frequently found in Asians than Caucasians, but we see quite a few, and I've got several cases here. And so it's a expression of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Here's an EKG for you, Malika. What do you think about this one? And compare this one to the other one. And then if anybody was present on the non on the, the patient that we presented with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you can think about that one too. So here we go. Take a look at this. Let's see. Um... <laughs> So the rate is 100 beats, about 100 beats per minute. Um, he does have a P wave in front of every current. No, it's, not, it's not really 100 beats. You count these little boxes. If you got four of these little boxes, it's 75. If you got five boxes, it's 50. To be 100, uh, 60. To be 100 beats would be three boxes. Sorry, that's three, right. Three 75, boxes. not 100. Yeah. Um, so he does have a P wave in front of every current complex. Uh, this is normal axes. I don't see a lot of Q waves anywhere. Um, I see a lot of T wave inversions in lead one, lead two, um, AVL, lead one, lead two, lead three. Uh, V4, V5, V6, throughout. So you'd say ischemia, right? Ischemic yeah. T wave changes. And so there is a, when you mention Q waves, there is an absence of Q waves, and there's actually the absence of a normal Q wave. And our Q, normal Q wave is where, Malika? So it should be right here. So we always see Q waves in 1 and L and V5 and V6. And those Q waves are the depolarization of the septum from left to right. So basically, when you're looking at it directly, you know, it's an R wave. When you're looking at it from behind, which would be from V5 and V6, it would be going the opposite direction from left to right. Septal depolarization would give you a tiny little Q right here. And it's not there, and it's not there, and it's not there. So that's, a, that's an abnormality when you don't see the Q waves. So we're always looking for Q waves. What about absent Q waves? Absent Q waves should tell us something is different about this. So there's an absent Q wave. And so what are we going to do next on this one? What would you like to do, Malika? I know what Pooh's going to do. Um, for this patient, I would probably go ahead and get um, a stress test. Let's see. So this patient is also asymptomatic. Now the last one asymptomatic, you were ready to go to the cath lab. Now this one you want a stress test. Can you explain? Um, it seems, I mean, just looking at the EKG, he has, uh, it seems like he might have ischemia. So, I mean, the next, the next step would be to do a stress test and see if there's any um, abnormality. Okay, so let's see what happened. Uh, the patient went, was sent from the clinic with that EKG no previous EKG for comparison, no symptoms, and the patient was sent from the clinic to the emergency room at a hospital. Okay, as a matter of fact, Brandon. So our hospital, patient shows up, and so what's going to happen when you show up in the emergency room? You're going to get some kind of traditional cardiology algorithm care, usually a six-pack. And so this patient has a chance of getting some of these tests, asymptomatic, they jump all over this case, case. The case is seen by an interventional cardiologist. What do interventional cardiologists like to do? Well, if you got a hammer, everything looks like a nail. But I feel like you should have different hammers. You should have a ball peen hammer. You should have a claw hammer. How about a rubber mallet? How about a tack hammer? How about having a bag full of hammers so that you can figure out which one, which hammer do you need on this patient? So, 
cardiac catheterization was the choice that was made by the interventional cardiologist who basically is looking for something to fix. So hang on, our cardiac cath. And so we would like comments from Pooh, our cardiac fellow, since we can't get Melody. Melody, if you happen to be available, just let us know, because we'd like to involve you in this case too. But go ahead, uh, Pooh, tell us what you think about the cardiac cath. We'll give you some uh, images to look at. So this is RAO projection. CERC looks pretty good. I don't see disease. OM, large OM, that looks okay. LED uh, looks okay too. I mean, no disease that I see so far in RAO card. And let's see. I'm going to row you through the cath pretty fast here. And you can comment as we see images. This is like a selective injection, mostly of the circumflex. Uh, this looks fine. Circle looks okay, too. Nothing sticking out so far, so no CAD. Getting radiation for nothing on the previous one, but this one, here we go. What do you see? Anything popping up at you? Uh, I see it looks good too. Uh, yeah, looking pretty good. LV gram, let's look at that if we have it. We're going to like this next injection. We're going to give you the left ventricular gram now. You ready for that? Mm -hmm. You're going to like this. This is a pretty one. Wow. Yeah, sister leaves obliterating. It's spade life. So. Isn't that beautiful? That's the spade sign. Malika, that's the spade sign. And this mm -hmm. looks like it looks like it's pretty appropriate for Valentine's Day coming up. Because we could <laughs> say it's like a heart sign if we can stop it at the right spot there. Hang on here, we'll see if that's gonna be a heart for us. Well look at that. Surprise. We've got it looks like more like a conch than anything, but uh, or a whelk, but it could be a heart. And so the heart sign, the spade sign, so especially during systole. Let's look at the spade sign. And so that is usually seen with apical hypertrophy, but it can be seen sort of when you have a prominent papillary muscle or prominent papillary muscles in the apex. So it's very difficult to discriminate where we have displaced papillary muscles or whether we have uh, a patient with apical tunnel left ventricle or apical hypertrophy of the left ventricle. But it's a very, this is a beautiful image. This should stop you in your tracks. If you've been trained by me, it should stop you in your tracks and you say, oh, look, there it is. And so let's see what happened. Are you ready? Who? what are we doing now? Is he trying to wire through it? Oh, let's play it, please. Whoa, Pooh, what happened oh, to this beautiful artery we had? Dissection. So uh, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so that normal coronary uh, now has uh, been totally dissected uh, with this wire uh, in an attempt uh, to uh, put a stent in uh, where we can't find a lesion, where the, the diagnosis of the spade-looking left ventricle during systole telling you about apical hypertrophy or displaced papillary muscle uh, was missed by the interventionalist who's got his hammer out and he's starting to nail away. And so here comes the balloon and here come the stents. Pretty ugly looking when we inject that. Pretty ugly looking massive dissection of the right coronary. <laughs> so uh, beginning the process of uh, 
angioplasty and then stenting, asymptomatic patient with an abnormal EKG. There's a stent now. We got a stent up there. Let's see if we can get some more stents in there. Nice stent in that uh, pretty dissection. And uh, here's our here's our stent. There's our stent there. Oh, there's a stent above it. There we go. We got two. Looks like we have two stents. At least two stents in there now. So that's a good thing. You need a little metal in your chest once in a while. I'm sorry. Where is the other stent? Maybe it's just one. Maybe it's just one. I was thinking there was another, but it looks like just one big stent. Run it backwards. Up. Oh, wait a minute. Let's run it backwards. And we'll see if we can tell. Yeah, it looks like just one stent as we run that backwards. Tom, oh, I have to call you back. I'm in the conference. So uh, let's move on uh, to a non-traditional uh, guided, image-guided, advanced cardiac image-guided uh, cardiology. Hang on. So the patient who was previously asymptomatic started to now have symptoms. So she's got exertional, retrosternal, chest pain, uh, and typical angina goes to back to her clinic in, uh, at uh, military, Brandon, and uh, basically is sent to me for evaluation now of new onset angina. Let's skip the echo. Uh, we're getting tight on time. Move on to a more definitive uh, understanding. So clinical findings of apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Some people have dysmount exertion, atypical chest pain, typical angina presyncope. Giant T-wave inversions. Guess what? Giant T-wave inversions of the anterior lateral EKG. And uh, these are some of the measurements of hypertrophy that we're looking for. And this spade-shaped configuration, the LV cavity at in diastole on not necessarily ventriculography, but ventricular imaging would be better to say that. And uh, normal levels uh, of the thickness at the base of the heart on CMR. So CMR is really our best image for this. Let's take a look. Well, here we are on MRI. So here's our black blood study. Wow. Who? What do you think about the apex of this left ventricle? It's huge. It's more <laughs> than 50 millimeters for sure. And let's let's measure this sucker. Whoa, 27. And you can see how it narrows down towards the base. And it gets to be pretty close to normal as we get to the base there. Meets the criteria. And here's our left ventricle. There's our papillary muscles again. There's the apex, which is muscle bound. Tiny little hole representing the cavity in the apex. And then heart thinning out as we go more towards the base. This picture. Looks pretty much like what you saw in the left ventriculogram. This is actually diastole, and we got the spade sign with the apex just sitting there, and there's no cavity to mount to anything, and then the base having a nice cavity, giving us the spade or heart sign. These are kind of scrambled images. So it's pretty much uh, that tells us what we were looking for. Let's go back to our slides. And so now we have two things we're looking at. We're looking at apical diagnosis of apical hypertrophy, 
and we're trying to distinguish that between apical displaced papillary muscles. And uh, one science patient uh, sort of came in, one patient as far as our, our cardiac science came in and uh, came the cardiac imaging route and uh, wound up getting some very, very nice pictures, getting a genetic workup and uh, having displaced papillary muscle. The other patient came in the traditional route, both asymptomatic, both dramatic ST and T wave changes. The first one more dramatic than the second one. First one didn't get a cardiac cath. Second one comes in presenting asymptomatic, you know, and has less severe findings on the EKG. Gets a cardiac cath, gets a dissected right, and gets stents in the right, and uh, doesn't get uh, the MRI and the CT uh, workup until later uh, when she develops now classical angina because of the dissection of the right. So it's very interesting to see the distinguishing these two. Uh, and here's a, here's a papillary muscle that's in the apex, and here's a bunch of uh, cords coming across and stuff. Here's another papillary muscle that's in the apex, and uh, this is what, what it looks like with uh, the apical findings. Here's somebody also who has basically not the resting hypertrophy of the left ventricle, but the apical insertion of the papillary muscle, apical insertion of the papillary muscle, some ventricular arrhythmia. This patient had previous bypass surgery and uh, hopefully not normal coronaries, and the apical insertion of the papillary muscle. And uh, basically, this is not apical hypertrophy. This is not the spade sign. The spade sign is frequently seen at rest during diastole as well. This is really has a nice uh, diastole and a nice area of uh, you know, cavity at the ape. So distinguish the two, apical hypertrophy versus uh, abnormal displacement of the papillary muscle, treatment of apical hypertrophy, treatment of abnormal displacement of papillary muscle, uh, and uh, angioplasty and stenting really isn't uh, a solution to apical hypertrophy unless you uh, infarct the LAD distally. And so, and that's one of the sequelae is that happens. These are some of our references. Do we have any questions? from anybody? Okay, well, thank you very much. We're glad you attended. We do have the conference tomorrow uh, on uh, our cardio-oncology conference. starts at 9 o'clock. If anybody is interested in attending that, that is an international con conference involving uh, U.S., uh, Poland, uh, London, and uh, Tel Aviv, and uh, other, other quarters of the world, uh, frequently India. And if anybody has any comments, I would appreciate comments about our presentations, as well as if you want an invitation to tomorrow's conference, it's eeharrison253 at hotmail.com is the email address. Thank you so much. I, uh, it's nice having uh, our uh, cardiac, re our uh, medical resident from Bayonet Point, Malika. We're glad you could come today. And uh, hopefully we get Melody up so she can talk next time. And uh, Dr. Uh, we appreciate your coming as well. Thank you very much, uh, all the Care Assure people and everybody who's involved in our programs. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Harris. Thank, thank you, Dr. You. Harris. Bye bye. Bye. Bye, Teresa, Shirley, Sandra, Shannon, Mindy, Michael, Mary, Janet, CJ, Christina, Jelly, and Janet, and Mary.